Welcome to the services of Glendale Presbyterian Church, located at 9218 State Highway 83 North in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Sunday school is at 9.30 a.m. with Sunday services at 11 a.m. Wednesday night services are the first and third Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. If you would, go ahead and be turning in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. If you're using your church Bible, page 1203. Page 1203, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm really glad that both Connie and Kathy could be here this morning to lead us in, in worship. We thought for a, a little bit that we were going to have to sing a cappella, and that's okay. We've done that before, but uh, it's always nice to have uh, that accompaniment. So thank you so much. Even though we don't sing a cappella very much, there is something we do every Sunday. It's something that maybe some of you, I know for me for sure, that when we do this thing, we don't always stop and think about what we're doing and why we're doing it. We don't always think about the words we're saying or the words we're singing. But when we do this thing, Typically, the kids that are usually here in the service, there's an internal alarm that goes off in those kids' uh, mind and hearts. And that alarm, excuse me, this uh, <laughs> um, earpiece is not cooperating with me very good this morning. Uh, that alarm that goes off in our kids is telling them it's about time to break out of here and go to kids' club. And for some of you parents and grandparents, when we do this particular thing, you kind of are at ease because now you know you'll have a little more space around you. Uh, nobody's right there in your space and you can kind of spread out instead of having to reach over and hit a kid on the arm and telling him to, he needs to uh, behave. Now you may have to reach over and hit your neighbor or your spouse and tell them, you need to stay awake for the service. You know about that. Some of you do. I think most of you have guessed by now that I'm referring to the singing of the doxology. It's something we do every Sunday. And yet, often, maybe because we do it so often, a danger is that it can become a ritual and we don't think about what we're doing or why we're doing it. We don't think about the words we're singing. R.C. Sproul shares in one of his books about his, one of his seminary professors who said this very often to all his students. He said, all sound theology must begin and end with doxology. All sound theology should begin and end with doxology. Doxology meaning a hymn of praise. That's why the Apostle Paul, as he wrote that great doctrinal masterpiece that we know as the book of Romans, as he's writing in his section about God's dealing with the nation of Israel, all of a sudden Paul just leaves his mindset and he breaks out into this uh, hymn of praise, this doxology from Romans 11. Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. And now Peter, in that same mindset, that same fashion, Peter follows up the introduction that we looked at last week where Peter talked about God's choice of us, his electing us to himself, 
how Peter shared how all three members of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all had a part in our salvation. And now on the heels of that, Peter breaks out into this marvelous doxology. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And we'll stop our reading there. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades, but this is the word of our God and it stands forever. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word and how it so speaks to the needs in our heart and life. And Father, I pray that over these next few minutes we have together to share around these verses that Peter wrote so many years ago, that the truth of your word will become very clear to us. The truth that you have for us, just what we need. And as your people, Father, that we will have ears to hear and we will respond accordingly. We pray to that end, in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Peter writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Peter believed, just like we just talked about with others, he believed that all sound theology must begin and end with doxology. And here, Peter's writing to the believers back then and to us believers about the living hope that's ours. He's going to call it our inheritance. And he's going to share in just those three verses how our living hope is anchored in our past, how it's active in our present, and how it should be anticipated in our future. So first, let's consider how this hope is anchored in our past. In other words, by anchored, I mean it's not swaying in the breeze. It's not being moved around because of the culture around us. It is firmly rooted, firmly grounded. Notice the motive behind this living hope, he says, is his great mercy. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. That's mercy. What do we deserve? Judgment. Death. That's what Paul wrote in Romans 6. The wages of sin is death. That's what we earn. That's what we deserve. But instead, Peter writes, God has been merciful that while we were dead in our sin, God raised us up and he gave us life. And so because of his mercy, he's caused us to be born again, Peter says, to a living hope. Now we hear a lot in Christian circles today about being born again. Some have made it very complicated. Some have made it very controversial. But it's very biblical. Being born again simply means to be born spiritually. To be born spiritually. We first heard about this truth of being born again the night Nicodemus came to visit Jesus. And in the process of the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus, Jesus made it clear to him that if you want to see the kingdom of God, if you want to experience God's kingdom, you must be born again. Spiritual rebirth. So as a rebirth, it begins as an act of God 
not an act of man. And because we were spiritually dead, we couldn't make any move in and of ourselves toward God. Because we were dead. The Bible's real clear about that. Dead, dead. And so God had to move first. And in this new birth, in this spiritual birth, just like in physical birth, that baby sitting in the back, and the rest of babies that you know, they didn't have a, a part in that, in that whole process. In his mercy, God reached down and the Bible says he made us alive. There's a theological term for that. It is regeneration. He has made us alive. And our faith is the fruit of that. Understand me here. It is not the cause of that. Our faith is the fruit of that. God had to move in our lives first to open our eyes and make us alive, and then we respond in faith. Notice Peter says that this was made possible, verse 3, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our living hope is anchored in the past. You see, when Jesus came out of the grave, it confirmed everything he said about himself to be true. That he was indeed God in the flesh. And when he came out of the grave, because of his death and resurrection, it secured our salvation. I want you to hear me well, church. It just didn't make salvation possible. His death and resurrection secured our salvation. So it brings us hope. It brings us living hope. Not just because he lives, but now because of Jesus and what he's done and God's mercy, we live also. Those who put their trust in Christ have been removed, have been transferred from the realm of hopelessness. Just like the opening scripture that Josh shared with us from Ephesians 2, where Paul writes what we were like before our salvation. And there he says, before we knew Christ, we were without hope. We were without God. But now we have a living hope. That's good theology. That's sound theology. And sound theology should begin and end with doxology. And so because of that, Peter's first words in this passage... Blessed be God. And because of that hope, we sing every Sunday, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And one of those blessings is that living hope that we have that is ours because of the resurrection. So not only is our living hope anchored in the past, it's also active in our present. It was secured for us in the past, but it's for us today. For those who know the Lord, for those who've been born again. And you see, with that hope, you can endure the worst of times. Somebody wrote it like this. They said, you can live in prison with hope better than you can live in a castle without hope. You see, it's that hope that lifts our eyes beyond ourselves. So let me ask you, when others are around you, as you go throughout your week, do they sense that hope in your life? Do they hear words of hope coming from you, or do they hear grumbling and complainings like everybody else? 
Do they see it in your attitude? I read about a man this past week who was dying of brain cancer. And surely he had no reason to hope. And yet one of his nurses noticed as she came in to visit him every day, she noticed there was something different about his outlook. Something different about his attitude. And she just couldn't get past it. So after several days of this, she's sitting in there with him and she walks over to the end of his bed and she pulls out his, his, the clipboard that has his chart on it. And on that chart, she writes this. We'll call him Mr. X. She writes, Mr. X is inappropriately joyful. <laughs> That's what living hope will do. And according to the doxology that we sing every week, that's what all creatures here below should be doing. Our lives should point others to that living hope that's ours because of his great mercy. <clears throat> It's a hope that's anchored in our past. It's a hope that is active in our present. And finally, I want us to see from what Peter writes here, it's a hope that is anticipated in the future. Some of you are familiar with a book out there that's been out for years and has been very, very popular, popular bestseller. It was written by a well-known TV preacher. And the title of the book is Your Best Life Now. Your Best Life Now. Listen to some of the quotes from this book. The author writes, God wants this to be the best time of your life. And then he writes, Happy, successful, fulfilled individuals have learned how to live their best life now. One more quote. As you put the principles found in these pages to work today, you will begin living your best life now. And here's the thing. All those quotes are absolutely true. If you're not a Christian. All those quotes are absolutely true. If you don't know the Lord. Because if you don't know the Lord. Your next life is going to be infinitely worse than this life. You will die with no meaning. You will die with no hope. You will die with eternal suffering. That's the worst possible life. And so this indeed, if you don't know the Lord, this indeed is your best life now. But on the other hand, if you're a child of God, if you've been born again, your sins are forgiven and you've come to embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord. This life is not even close to being your best life. We can't even comprehend what our best life will be like. Because contrary to what's popular today, in religious circles, even in some Christian circles. The Lord is not promising us here in this life, he's not promising us a full, rich, happy, satisfying, trouble-free life full of 
health, and wealth, and success. Oh, he does promise that. But not for this life. He promises a full, rich, satisfying life of health and wealth. He promises us absolute joy and peace and perfection in the life to come. But the other side of the coin, and some of you don't want to hear this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> the other side of the coin is... You know some of the things the Lord does promise us in this life? He promises us trouble. He promises us persecution, suffering, rejection, difficulty, trials and temptations, sickness, and he even promises physical death. So for Christians, this is our worst life now. Not that it's that bad, but in comparison to what God has in store for us. It's the worst when you think about what our life's going to be like, our life to come. Which is our best life. Our best life as a Christian begins the moment we leave this life. And so Peter presents that truth as he writes about this living hope, this inheritance, and how we should be anticipating it. Look again at verses 4 and 5. Peter says, We have been born again to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. An ironclad reservation. Just as some people, maybe some of you even know, when they were physically born into this world, they were born into a family of prestige and power and influence and, and riches. They were born into a material inheritance. But notice Peter said those who are born again, their inheritance, he says, is imperishable. That is, it is not subject to decay or destruction. He says, our inheritance is undefiled. That is, it is unstained. It is not polluted by sin. And then he says, it is unfading. That was a word used in Peter's day of a flower that did not wither away. So this inheritance will never, ever lose its magnificence. Notice he says, this inheritance is being kept in heaven for you. And so our best life is not now. <laughs> Thank the Lord for that. Our best life is not now. Rather, our best life is in the life of to come. And you know, that's why, that's the, the word, the truth that I tried to comfort Ralph's family with last Sunday afternoon as we stood out by the graveside. That as full of a life as Ralph lived, and he did, his real life was just beginning. And it'll never end. You see, in order to receive that inheritance that Peter's writing about, Peter says, you have to be part of the family. How do you get to be in the family? You've got to be born into the family. <laughs> You've got to be born again. The only way to be part of that spiritual family is by receiving Jesus into your life. The Apostle John writes it like this in John 1.12. 
but as many as received him who believed in his name. To them he gave the right to become the children of God. Something else I want you to notice from the text. Notice he says, this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. He continues and says, verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Peter says, not only is that inheritance being guarded, Peter says, you're being guarded as well. God is keeping you safe. God is walking with you. And Peter says, we are kept safe through faith. So God just doesn't give us saving faith at the moment of salvation. He gives us sustaining faith to live a day-by-day life of victory. And that was so important for these believers Peter's writing to. Because as we're going to see as we move through the rest of the letter, the persecutions have, have hit, a, had, hit a new level in their life. The fire's been turned up a little bit. And they needed to know that truth. That God was giving them sustaining faith. And I want you to understand, it's not faith in our achievements. It's faith in God's achievements. It is he who's caused us to be born again. One of the Puritan writers put it like this. He wrote, God justifies the believer, not because of the worthiness of his belief, but because of the worthiness of the one in whom he believes. He alone is worthy. And because he is, we have been given a living hope, an inheritance that is anchored in the past, an inheritance that is active and should be active in our present, and an inheritance that we can anticipate in the future, those who know the Lord. That's good theology. That's sound theology. And sound theology should begin and end with doxology. And so as we close this morning, we're going to do something a little different. Instead of singing one of the hymns out of the hymn books like we usually do or the uh, screen, we're going to sing the doxology again. And as we close with the doxology, I want you to just take a moment and think about the truth behind those words we're singing. And think about how the doxology shouldn't just be part of our lives on Sunday morning, but as we go throughout our week, we should be thanking God for the family he's blessed us with and the friends. We should be thanking God for a nice warm house to go to and food to eat. We should be thanking the Lord for the opportunities he gives us. So many things that we should be saying all throughout the week. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And so with the Apostle Peter this morning, as God's people, we say, blessed be God. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for the great mercy that you have shown to all of us. Because of your mercy and grace, you've caused us to be born again to a living hope. A hope that we can only imagine right now what life's going to be like in heaven. But until then, Father, you've given us a living hope today. Help us as your people to be thankful people. To look for opportunities to say, blessed be God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Remind us, Father, of those things. And help us to leave here this morning thankful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.